So, hello, welcome to week four of Religion in the Biosphere. And the religious tradition we're going to be looking at this week is uh, a Native American tradition uh, as reflected in the effigy mounds in Wisconsin. So I think it's easy to approach Native American traditions and think of it as in a very broad lens and that uh, Native American traditions, you know, uh, are in good terms with the natural world, certainly better than us and sustainable and, and um, uh, treat the natural world well. And I think that's the kind of gauzy, soft focus view of Native American traditions that I'd like to avoid. And what we're gonna do is not look at every different uh, Native tradition for thinking about the natural world, but rather the one that's reflected here in Wisconsin in the effigy mounds. These were built by the woodland peoples from about 500 AD to 1200 AD, but especially weighted towards the latter end of that era. Um, to get started, I'm gonna share uh, the screen so we can look at slides like I did for the presentation last week. Okay, so what you're looking at is perhaps the largest Native American mound in the US. So this was, you know, it's, it's considerably um, worn down, but you can see from those people walking up that it's still quite large. This is Cahok the site of Cahokia outside St. Louis. And um, this was at one point the, size, the site of a large city. Um, here's kind of an artist rendition of what that city looked like. Um, with the, the large mound that we were looking at previously, straight ahead, Monk's Mound. And then it would have at one time been kind of surrounded by smaller mounds, of which you can still see traces, as well as a settlement um, kind of outside on the out, uh, around it. Um, could have been up to about 100,000 people living in this city at one point. Um, so there are throughout North America these remnants uh, of earthen mounds that are evidence for past native civilizations. Um, what's different about the Wisconsin Indian mounds is that they are uh, in shapes and in forms. And that's why they're called effigy mounds. They can be in the shape of birds, of bears, of panthers, of water sprites, of just all kinds of different small creatures um, or large creatures. And uh, what the meaning of this is and what they're trying to do is what we'll, our question will be. But I want to be clear that this is in relation, that this was a um, civilization that, uh, and culture that developed alongside others that were elsewhere in North America and that we have mounds for. Now, one of the things that's most unique about these effigy mounds is that they are distributed literally in Wisconsin, mostly in the southern half of Wisconsin. Um, you'll see the sum, those red dots are where they kind of um, uh, poke into Iowa by a little bit, but the vast majority, like 15 to 20,000 of these mounds are in uh, our state of Wisconsin. And uh, you see there, uh, get, a, get a sense of their distribution. You'll see that um, uh, you can see Lake Winnebago and Appleton is of course just up there on the north. And then there's a whole bunch of those black dots along the eastern side of Lake Winnebago. So that was a site where there are lots of effigy mounds. And one of the things I like doing with this class when we're on campus is visiting High Cliff, both to see the birds, but then also to see these um, effigy mounds that are up there. Um, it, it's easy to miss the importance of effigy mounds because we're so used to massive modern earthworks. So if you drive down any freeway, you will see um, you know, overpasses like this one. And in order to make these work, you've had bulldozers and earthworks that build up mounds on the side. So we're just surrounded by big earthworks. And we don't think really twice of the kind of low uh, mounds that Native Americans built. But when settlers first arrived in the 19th century to a lot of parts of Wisconsin, these were very obvious to them that there were, they were surrounded by multiple, you know, again, there were 15 to 20,000 in Wisconsin and, and people noted these immediately, the presence of these mounds. This is the view from up on uh, the edge of High Cliff. And this is looking out over Lake Winnebago. And then you can see Appleton 
the white buildings out on the horizon towards the, towards the right. And this is the site, as we'll see in a moment, of a number of these effigy mounds. Here are some students from a few years back. Uh, I think this was the first group of students coming through this course, but uh, like I said, it's fun to come up here uh, with this class. Now, when you're up there on that ledge, uh, you'll, if you just walk to the side from the trail a little bit, you'll see these markers for the mounds. So twin buffalo mounds. Now in this case, it's covered with leaves, so you really can't see it that well. And sometimes there's trees growing on the mounds themselves. Here you can see the mounds kind of sticking out from the leaf coverage. Um, here's another version, and you really can't see that much. And like I said, um, I think with, in relationship to our expectations for massive earth moving, these mounds aren't partic don't really stand out to us, but they really did if you came to a world without, without this kind of huge mechanized uh, uh, movement of the earth. Here's a sign on some of the mounds. This is a panther mound. We'll see what those look like in just a second. Um, here's an example. This is a, a Wisconsin scientist, Increase Laugham, really important guy for the 19th century. Um, and he comes and he does a complete survey of these effigy mounds in Wisconsin. And so this is uh, the portion of his book where he's talking about that. From Menasha, we went in a, a sailboat across the north end of Lake Winnebago to examine and survey the mounds on top of a high limestone cliff or ledge. So it, it isn't known yet as High Cliff State Park or anything like that. It's just a, 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 a cliff with a ledge on top. On the northwest quarter of Section 36 is a small clearing on the bank of the lake, not far from the foot of the bluff in which were traces of three long mounds. And in the adjacent forest are three small embankments extending across the small ridge from the bank of the lake to a valley back of it. We had much difficulty in climbing the ledge, which is quite a formidable aspect and is probably 200 feet high above the water, the last 40 or 50 being perpendicular or nearly so. So you can imagine, if you've been to High Cliff, you can easily imagine this. Um, and if you haven't been to High Cliff, then when you get back to campus, make sure you get out there. From the top commences an almost level plateau extending towards the east, and here we were fully paid for our labor by the magnificent view of the lake and surrounding country. That view is the, I just showed you an image of standing up on top of uh, the, the, the cliff there and then looking out. That's exactly the same view that he's talking about. Um, those who have examined the banks of the Niagara below the Great Falls or the mountain ridge as is seen in western New York and Canada will have a correct idea of this ledge of limestone and being composed of a rock of the same geological age, the resemblance is not to be wondered at. Now, the one thing that Latham doesn't know is that it's actually exactly the same geological formation as formed the Niagara. So he's struck by the, the similarity in the rock, but it it's actually is the same formation. And here he gets to the mounds. Passing along the ridge, we came upon the series of ancient works represented upon the plate, extending for some distance near the edge of the rocky escarpment. It will be observed that they are of the same forms as those heretofore described further south and southwest. And with one exception, or two exceptions, uh, are arranged with heads toward the south. So this is, he goes up onto the cliff, there's a plateau up there, and it's there that he encounters this series of effigy mounds, which are still there and which can still be seen, though they're worn down and um, uh, not necessarily super impressive at this point. Now, this is what the way he drew them. So you can see here um, a lot of long kind of indeterminate forms and then a couple things that look like birds, all right? Um, and then here's another view. You can see the bird and then these, these longer forms that people kind of argue about what, what they were. You can see that there's Lake Winnebago, you get a shoreline, then the cliff, and then you're up on top of a plateau looking out over um, uh, the, the lake and what goes beyond that. Now here's another view. This is the Mississippi River. Um, and here on the bluffs of the Mississippi, actually on the Iowa side, you get the uh, Effigy Mound National Monument. Um, and uh, this is, before I go further, just to recognize that these effigy mounds aren't sprinkled just here and there randomly in the landscape, that the builders clearly knew where they wanted these, and they chose these spots with magnificent views. So um, cliffs, 
escarpments overlooking bodies of water and with significant views seem to be what really draw them to do to create these effigy mounds. Other places are down in lowlands and bogs and wetlands where there's springs and uh, probably places that are um, were at one point stacked with wildlife. Those are also going to be places where you'll find these mounds. So they're built at significant spots and we can um, maybe guess from that that there's some level of sacredness that's here. Um, coming back here to the Effigy Mound National Monument, if you see it from the air, you start seeing these well-defined figures that will leap out at you. So here you have a row of bears and then a couple birds and then something that's a little more indeterminate. And uh, you, these are helped to identify because you've got the park service has kind of drawn around them with chalk so that they stand out. And that's something that kind of avoids the the way these kind of slowly fade away and disappear over the years. But here you can see them, you can see them really clearly. Um, and then when you're on the ground walking around the monument, you, these, this is what it looks like. Um, in the summer, they'll kind of mow it and then they'll leave the, the mounds themselves unmowed so that the, that again makes the, uh, the shapes pop and come out more clearly. Um, now, a lot of times there, there's bears, there's birds, and then this is uh, kind of an odd shape. This is north of Madison. It's known as the Man Mound, and this is a mound in the shape of a human being, at least the body, right? You can see the, the, the legs and the arms, and the, the head is a bit more unknow unknown exactly what that is, um, but some kind of a human-like uh, creature. And you can see, just get a sense of how these were completely disrespected as far as uh, modern road builders and they just cut a road right through the legs, right? These were for many years, not anything to be preserved or uh, really considered much, uh, but you just kind of mow them down if there was, uh, uh, if, if, if you wanted to build a road uh, in around one. Okay, so now we come to the question of what, what exactly did these things mean? We start off with, uh, a way of thinking about the cosmos that is reflected um, not only in these mounds, but in pottery and in other kinds of art and stories that we have that come down to us from Native American, uh, uh, Native Americans who live in the Wisconsin area. And this kind of layered cosmos. So there's the sky, there's the earth, and there's the water, or this kind of underworld. And that underworld is kind of watery, springs and wells and wetlands um, uh, is the way that's considered. The earth, of course, the, kind of on the surface where people live and you get animals that you can start to recognize like bears, panthers, um, uh, uh, buffalo, some people think, and then the bird figures that you'll get up in the air. So the first way to, to think about these mounds is that they ref represent kind of a, a picture of the cosmos as a whole, right? That there are these, these three levels are represented in the uh, uh, in uh, in the shapes and, and 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 the creatures. So these can you can when you think about these kind of conglomerations of effigies, that's the you can think of them as kind of symbols or pictures, almost mandalas in some ways of the um, of the cosmos. Um, like I said, this is uh, represented not just in mounds, but also we have some rock art. Um, that, that's in Wisconsin, where you have this um, reference to a kind of a, a thunderbird, which is, uh, again, giving us this sense of a story reference, which, which has an upper level and then a, a, a lower level for the cosmos. And something similar is being represented in the, uh, uh, in the effigy mounds. All right, now if you, another clue for what these things mean is looking at the spread of these um, life forms in the landscape. And you'll see that there's different ones dominate in different areas. It's, it's rare to get just a completely pure bunch of land effigies or air effigies or um, underworld effigies. Um, but there do seem to be concentrations of them that are spread in different places. And one way to understand this is to think about a culture, right? This was a kind of, these reflect a single unitary culture. But then you also have different clans that might identify with different creatures um, from the upper, lower, and, um, and surface of the earth, 
right? So those clans would perhaps have something to do with how uh, uh, which, are, which are portrayed in, in, in what areas. Um, one other thing to know about the mounds, another important piece is that these are burials. Every one of those mounds that we have is a burial, sometimes multiple burials uh, that, were, that were in them. So they appears to be made over generations, certainly over years, perhaps over generations, these mound uh, complexes were built. Uh, people were buried maybe at one time of the year, people would bring bones of those who had died back, they'd be buried, uh, and then slowly um, there'd be shapes that would be given to them. The shapes as a whole point to the way the cosmos was understood, but then um, there could be clan identifications that also generate the individual, whether there's a bird here or a bear here or what have you. And like I was arguing, part of that clan argument would go to the way there's actually a distribution of these things across, as if there's different areas of the state which more closely connect to um, different types of creatures from those, um, from those different areas. So within the, within the social structure itself of this people, we can see that there was a, the social structure represents uh, the cosmos as well. Um, and here's from, this is a paragraph from a study on the mounds. The effigy mounds in this interpretation can be considered as areas of social reproduction, places to which people returned again and again for the purpose of lifeway reinforcement and renewal. It's more than just a coincidence that these places were also areas which contained nearby large quantities of high yielding and annual, annually renewable natural resources. So let me just unpack that for a moment. So first of all, they, they were placed in areas that were important culturally. They were you know, important uh, grounds for wildlife hunting. They were important visually for overlooks and, and, and views. These were sacred space in one way or another. So that's where uh, these kind of groups of effigy mounds um, were built. Secondly, they were, they were built over many years. So they're this quote, areas of social reproduction, much like a church or a mosque or a place of worship of any kind is a place where people gather and then affirm through the architecture, through the liturgy, through their words, through their togetherness, a sense of cohesion and group identity. That is the way that these mounds, um, these groups of mounds functioned as a way to come together and affirm a life way, affirm a view of the cosmos as a whole, and also affirm social bonds and the kind of clan divisions that, um, that made up the, the social bonds. Here's one other statement. Effigy mounds were built to symbolize and ritually maintain balance and harmony with the natural world within the context of ceremonialism to renew the world. So the idea is as people would come together and uh, take part in burials, there would also be rituals and um, uh, recitations that would allow for um, uh, a sense of togetherness and a sense that things are right with the cosmos as a whole. Our clans and our, so our social world is representing uh, that, um, that cosmos. And here in the landscape itself, we are representing the cosmos with these different, these different creatures. Now back to this image that I started with. This is the Cahokia outside St. Louis and these, this kind of the remains of this massive system. So we might ask why were the effigy mounds there? These weren't just always built. From time immemorial, these people, the woodland people built effigy mounds up until um, you know, the arrival of Europeans or anything like that. There was a very small window, probably from about 900 to 1200 AD, these effigy mounds were being built. Um, now the culture we know went back 500 years earlier than that. So why all of a sudden are effigy mounds being built? Well, one, probably the major argument is that the Mississippian culture, which built the Cahokia and these large mounds, was spreading and moving up to the north, into Wisconsin. There's evidence of that in one site known as Aztalan, um, between Milwaukee and Madison, where you get this kind of Mississippian style uh, city mound that was being built. So as there was pressure coming up from the south and perhaps conflict between this lifestyle of the south and then this woodland lifestyle that had dominated here in Wisconsin, there was a need to kind of represent almost like graffiti or as um, uh, markers on the landscape that this is a place, this is the site for this culture. 
Um, and um, so there's this kind of group pressure uh, and, 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 and maybe conflict that was driving these expressions of identity that were being written onto the landscape. Um, and so that is, again, these aren't mounds that simply have always been there as some kind of longstanding eternal practice, but they were driven by a particular time and, um, and a conflict over these centuries. Now, eventually those people were, um, uh, mound building ceased, um, and a new life way took, uh, uh, began, which is related to what the Mississippian people brought up. Now, um, I think it's interesting to go back and think about these effigy mound builders because the way we configure and order the landscape ends up representing our, the way we see the world. So here's an overhead view of New York City and Manhattan, and you see Central Park, and then this gridded uh, street system. And I, I think we too often pass over and don't think about grids, right? How do grids represent a way of thinking about the landscape, that it can be ordered, that it can be, everything can be equally easy to get to. There can be an address. Um, it can be uh, diced up for maximum profit, all kinds of things that are reflected in this grid, which ultimately is also a reflection, a mandala of some ways, of, uh, uh, of a view of nature and the natural world. And I'd say this is quite different than, uh, reflects a quite different view of the natural world than what you get with these um, effigy mounds and the way that that represents a harmony and a, um, a sense of human beings as being part of this natural world as opposed to the kind of domination that I'd say is reflected in a grid like this. Now, if you move to contemporary um, uh, Wisconsin and Madison, then you would know what you know from the air besides the uh, airport and city is the, the way the farmland is gridded out. Right, and that's also a reflection of values and ways of thinking about the landscape that are quite different than what we'd see in the woodland people. Um, and it's these farm, the farmland basically overrode and plowed under thousands and thousands of these effigy mounds, which are no longer present in our landscape as a result, except in a, in a, in some areas. Okay, so what you're going to be writing about is uh, taking, thinking about these effigy mounds and the world that they represent, but comparing it to the video that you're also going to watch on um, Cave of Forgot, um, Cave of the, the cave video that I'm gonna put up a link to about Paleolithic art. And I'd like you to think about and reflect on in some way that those two, uh, how are they different? So here's one, the, um, um, the effigy mound culture. Um, how exactly is effigy mound culture different from the Paleolithic art that you'll see in that video? Um, and that's what I'd like you to consider and that I'll kind of put up some thoughts about that as well on Monday. Okay, thank you everybody.